Madam President, Sumaruga, Your Excellency, Premier Li Keqiang, distinguished heads of state, distinguished heads of government, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the World Economic Forum. When we met last year, we were quite full of optimism. Now we are meeting again, and it looks like as if the world would be at the crossroads. Two ways to go. The way of collaboration, the way of mutual respect, and on the other hand, the way of polarization, extremism. At the end, it's our choice. And here, I think this assembly is a great example for collaboration. Collaborations of all stakeholders of global society. I'm very pleased to welcome here officially the 1,500 business leaders, the 300 members of government, the heads of civil society, the young generation, the media leaders, our experts, a true representative reflection of global society. We are here committed to improving the state of the world, to look at all the issues under the theme, the new global context. I have to ask you for your understanding that our program is so complex. There are over 300 different sessions. But I think this meeting is different because it reflects all the challenges we have on the global agenda. And what we want to do is to deal with those challenges in a holistic way. I also would like to ask you, and you are doing it already, as I have seen today, to engage as much as possible. The forum has become the Institution for Public-Private Cooperation, and we are launching here during this meeting 10 different global public-private cooperation projects. But first we have to restore trust in our world. Trust is a very probably the most precious good. Now, we have to show the world that we are trustworthy. And the best way to do it is to respond to the needs of those who have entrusted us with leadership responsibility. So, we have a great obligation to look not only after our own interests, but as you are doing, to engage in manifold ways and to make sure that this meeting is at the beginning of a renaissance of trust in the world. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, Madam President. Madam President, I want to use this opportunity also to thank the Swiss Federal Council, the Swiss authorities, the Swiss people, but also the people and the authorities of Graubünden and of Davos for the great hospitality. Since 45 years, 
We are here, this has become our home, and this was only possible by the support of the federal, cantonal, and local authorities. So a big thank you. Madam President, we know that you in your government work, but also before you joined the government, you showed a particular solidarity with the people who are not so privileged as most of we here in this hall are. And it shows by your commitment to issues I just mentioned migration, which is very close to your heart. And I'm sure, Madam President, when looking at our program, you will have seen that many sessions reflect your concerns. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome very cordially the President of our host country, Madam Somaruga. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, many of us already met last week at an unscheduled event in one of Switzerland's neighboring countries. The attack on the editorial staff of Charlie Hebdo was an attack on the concept of a free society. How did people in France react to the attack? They came together for the largest public gathering in France since 1944. Several million people took to the streets. Their message was clear. We stand united and we say what we think. I was greatly impressed by the demonstration of unity. Not only the fact that so many people took to the streets, but the way in which they did so. They remained calm and peaceful. There was no aggression. The people on the streets knew that this was not the time for anger. The Paris March was a demonstration for freedom and for our universal values. The Paris March was a demonstration of human dignity. Today, we once again assure France and its citizens of our solidarity. And we thank President François Hollande for his determined yet humane reaction to the tragic events. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this year's annual meeting is the, global, the new global context. If I had to describe this global context in just one word, I would say it is one of uncertainty. I'm not only talking about the current conflicts and crisis regions, I am also referring to the situation in the comparatively prosperous countries of Europe. Of course, Europe is not short of problems, but historically, speaking, it has probably never been a better place to live than it is today. Nonetheless, in many countries in Europe, nationalist and populist parties are on the rise. They are critical of globalization, reject immigration, and incite skepticism towards the EU. It is particularly worrying that such political parties enjoy popularity even in countries with low rates of unemployment and strong economies. How can we explain this? The answer to this question is complicated. One thing is for sure, overall globalization has led to greater prosperity and reduced poverty. However, that is not the case everywhere. 
Globalization induces in many people a deep-seated sense of uncertainty. Even in prosperous countries, more and more people feel that they will only be able to hold on to their jobs if they become even more efficient, more mobile, more flexible, and more industrious. Are we creating an economic environment in which only high performers working under constant pressure can prevail? Such fears are not entirely unfounded. Competition is growing for the highly developed economies too. In more and more countries, workers are still paid low wages, but now offer highly skilled labor too. And this means that even leading economies can only remain successful if they are prepared to continuously make structural change. Structural change in itself is not a bad thing, but let's face the fact, structural change produces winners and losers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something we cannot simply accept. I repeat, globalization has a range of effects. So let us talk about both sides of the coin. We may suppress or gloss over the unpleasant things, but sooner or later, they will come to the surface. And when they do, the force of the impact is invariably twice as great. I am sure that one of the reasons why national conservative parties in Europe are popular right now is that globalization has caused a vague sense of uncertainty. These parties invoke a national sovereignty and a native country symbolizing familiarity and safety. We know that this describes an ideal past that never was. And we don't have to look far back into Europe's history to find bitter poverty, misery, and conflict. Yet, it would be a dangerous mistake to ignore the uncertainty felt by many people. Many citizens find it difficult to identify with an economy whose dimensions have reached unimaginable proportions. Many are asking, how far is the balance of power shifting if the turnover of some global corporations is higher than the gross national product of many states, as is the case today. What do we think when we hear that shares are no longer held for several years, but for an average of 22 seconds, as one economist recently calculated? How much confidence can we have in financial institutions that break the law and end up paying billions of dollars in fines, what values do they communicate? Ladies and gentlemen, who can provide the people with the answers to these questions? Many business leaders have avoided assuming the responsibility for answering such questions for far too long. What we need is business people who want to earn money, but who also want something more. We need business people who want to give others a chance. We need employers who set benchmarks, not only in terms of profit, but also in terms of corporate culture. And we need, for example, commodities groups that prohibit all forms of forced labor and exploitation and which recognize basic rights, for example, workers' freedom of assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, policymakers must also accept their share of responsibility. They must put in place a sound framework based on the law, rule of law, legal certainty, no corruption, and the protection of human rights and social justice. These elements are key to a healthy economic and social order. 
it is the task of politicians to introduce and enforce these elements where they do not yet exist, and it is for politicians to protect and defend them where they already apply. And this requires determination, clear values, and steadfastness. Nothing has greater value in politics than credibility. It was an important gesture for politicians from around the world to take part in the march in Paris to defend freedom of expression. But what is far more important is to defend human rights day after day in one's own country, even when there are no TV cameras around. Here in Davos, let us also discuss the fact that in many places in the world, journalists are being imprisoned, even punished by flogging, simply because they write what they think. Ladies and gentlemen, many of us are asking questions following the attack in Paris, existential questions that we have perhaps not asked ourselves for a long time. Who are we really? What values are so important to us that we consider them to be universal? What does dignity mean to us? I believe we also need to ask ourselves these questions here at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos. <laughs>